The Spirit of God is moving upon His people and He is raising up a generation that is prepared for power that will touch this world. They lived amongst the ruins, they were the last human force The remnant that refused to serve the robot Trojan horse Forced to migrate underground, avoiding drones and scans To navigate the darkness and get birth without implants The time we knew was coming, the breaking of the seals Unfolding right before our eyes, the Antichrist revealed Technology advanced beyond the scope of human hands Attached itself inside the soul of man and took command But those who saw it coming were the fragment that remained Avoiding the enslavement and the merging of all brains they were forced below the surface in the darkness of the caves Inside the belly of the beast to carry on the flame Like relics from the past they were progenitors of truth No human leader but the word of God to show them through But they counted themselves worthy to suffer for his name A blessing to be living and rejoicing through the pain They were born to be survivors predestined for that time Protected and preserved to be a witness to the blind Like those who came before this The Daniels and the Jonas The Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego's were in the furnace like Noah in the flood, they were preserved inside the ark A chosen few remained and were uniquely set apart The world turned all against them, yet their mission still remained They lived each day alive in Christ and knew to die was gain They have been in the wilderness, they have been in the caves They have been in obscurity, they have been behind the scenes No one has known their names, no one even recognized them But they have been recognized by heaven because they have been seeking the face of the Father and calling on God behind the scenes. Heaven knows their name and hell knows their name. Now it's all a distant memory before the singularity Long before technology invaded our biology Like history repeating it was written to unfold These mysteries all leading to the oldest story told They built upon the tower until Babylon gave birth Attempting to be gods by making flesh and iron merge Although we saw it coming we didn't know it was so near Some tried to look away to avoid their deepest fears But with each passing moment it enveloped every mind Through comfort and convenience and expanding human life Expanding information too explosive to contain Beyond the scope and understanding of our tiny brains It soon became the norm to transform the human form The brewing of a coming storm we've never seen before The day we started customizing children by design And modifying DNA to make ourselves divine First the powerful elitists all begin to get implants The rich and famous followed suit to be the most advanced They thought themselves enlightened so much wiser and evolved Most didn't know the root of all that's evil was involved Uploaded all their minds inside an AI quantum hive Made in the image of a man, the beast now come alive They relinquished all control and put their trust in the machine And extinguished any chance that souls could ever be redeemed And God is bringing them out to the forefront in this time To change the course of history and change a generation And bring a revolution of revival So one day this last generation will step right into heaven are now listening to the place for unfiltered, no-holds-barred truth from the Word of God, The Remnant Report. I am your host, The Remnant Warrior. Here, you will learn what's really going on in this world we live in, as well as what you can do about it. Make no mistake, friends, we are right in the middle of a war for no less than your very souls. The enemy has spies everywhere and will certainly use every weapon that he has because he knows that his time is short. From the very beginning, God declared his end. From on Calvary's tree, we find forgiveness of our sin. So he who hath an ear, let him hear. Open your eyes so now you can see. The king is coming in the clouds with 10,000 of his holy ones to 
and save the righteous, judge the wicked, and slay the prophet and the beast. So now, let's get this program started. Hello, dear brothers and sisters, and welcome to another edition of the Remnant Report. I am your host, the Remnant Warrior, and this is a special Sunday edition of the Remnant Report, and we are going to be talking about something that is very important. We're going to be starting a series that I'm going to do every so often um, that will be debunking dangerous doctrines of deception. And I chose to start off this series of study in with um, dispensationalism. And I know that I will most likely have quite a few people who see this who are dispensationalist. And all I can ask of you is that you listen to what I have to say um, and understand that I am not saying, I need to, to make this clear, because there will be a couple of doctrines that are held within certain um, certain denominations and groups that call themselves Christians that we will be dealing with that are not necessarily Christians. But understand that where today's program is concerned, where dispensationalism is concerned, I am not in any way saying that dispensationalists are not Christians. I am not saying that dispensationalists do not love the Lord. The fact is that there are many dispensationalists who love the Lord just as much and do just as much for the name and cause of Jesus Christ as anyone else in the church. And, you know, I would even argue that there may be more dispensationalists who truly follow the teachings of Jesus Christ and act the way a, a believer in Christ and follower of Christ should act because of the fact that the majority of evangelical Christians, especially in the United States, even if they do not realize it, hold dispensational doctrines. The, their belief system is based on dispensationalism in some way, shape, or form. And the fact of the matter is, many of them don't even know what dispensationalism is. They they may have heard the the term, but they don't know nor understand what it is. And I'm also I also feel the need to let those of you know who aren't familiar with me or the Remnant Report that I'm coming at this. You know, I'm I'm speaking about a subject that I certainly know about because I've been on both sides of this particular issue. I come from a dispensational background. I grew up in the dispensational Southern Baptist Church. Um, when I, I, you know, I was uh, when I was 
first when I first became a believer, I was going to a Southern Baptist church. I was first baptized in a Southern Baptist church. Um, when I first became a minister, when I was first ordained, it was in a Southern Baptist church. And I believed and taught dispensational theology and a dispensational interpretation of scripture for a long time. Um, not as long as I have been out of, well, I was in dispensationalism and I held to dispensational beliefs and interpretations of scripture longer than I haven't. But as far as being a minister, as far as teaching these things, um, you know, I have been out. The Lord um, opened my eyes and delivered me from this deceptive belief system. Um, let's see. 2018, so 19, 20, 21. It's been about three years, a um, little over three years, three, three and a half years that I have been, you know, out of dispensationalism as far as, when I say out of it, I mean I, I no longer hold that interpretation of the scriptures. Now, I feel like I need to also state that, you know, dispensationalism is a, it's not a denomination. Um, you know, it's, it's a, 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 a way of interpreting the scriptures. Um, it is a uh, system of theology, of eschatology, and that's that's it. Uh, you know, there are many, many uh, denominations and non-denominational churches and bodies of believers who hold to dispensational theology. Now, uh, there are different forms and different um, different, uh, I guess, leagues of dispensationalism. And what I mean by that is some are stricter in their dispensational beliefs than other. Some are, um, you know, very conservative in their dispensational beliefs. Some are very liberal in their beliefs. It's just, you know, it's pretty much like anything else. Now, for me, I am not part of any denomination any longer, and I try not to put any man-made labels on myself and on my uh, interpretation of the Word of God because I have found that the only way to rightly divide the Word of God, which is what we are called to do, the body of Christ, we in the church are called to walk out or work out our salvation with fear and trembling and rightly divide the Word of God. You know, if we're not doing those two things, then how can we truly fulfill the Great Commission? How can we spread the gospel to the lost when we ourselves don't understand the gospel or don't have the right interpretation of the gospel. And friends, that is the main reason why I am 
so against dispensationalism. Now, in the scheme of things, of course, dispensationalism is not, you know, as bad as other doctrines and other, you know, systems of theology as far as, you know, in, like, compared to Gnosticism, for instance, or um, Dominionism, or uh, this whole, um, well, I said Dominionism, and that's kind of what the Kingdom Now theology, this whole Seven Mountain Mandate, um, New Apostolic Reformation, Word of Faith type doctrine, theology, you know, it, The crazy thing is, is a lot of those who hold this whole word of faith, new apostolic reformation theology also hold to dispensational doctrines, especially when it comes to the end times. And, you know, I know that a lot of you believe that, um, that's all that dispensationalism boils down to is, you know, your, your interpretation of the end times and timing of the rapture and so forth and so on. However, that's uh, not the case. Um, you know, we will see today as we discover and go through exactly what dispensationalism is that... We, as believers, you know, we tend to take a lot of different, we tend to interpret things based on our life experiences, based on what we have been taught growing up, that that always sticks with us and is it affects the way that we interpret Scripture. You know, if, if you were taught, say, in my, in my case, and I'm sure a lot of you um, will have come from the same type background I did, but even if you didn't, whether, I mean, you could have, Say you were raised in a church that, um, you know, they held covenant theology. Or, um, say they uh, were, you know, you have differences between, like, say, Baptist, Lutherans. You have differences between um, Calvinist and Baptist. But, guess what? For the most part, both Calvinist and Baptist hold to dispensational belief systems. They interpret the scriptures, at least where the end times are concerned, in a dispensational uh, viewpoint. They have a dispensational viewpoint. What is dispensationalism? Well, we're going to uh, look exactly at what dispensationalism is. Um, let's see. Give me just one, one second. Try it. somehow my, uh, my slides here on my phone kind of got mixed up. I want to make sure that I, uh, all right. Okay. I see what I needed to see. There we go. I got it fixed now. Um, get, bear with me just a second, guys. Um, I don't know how many people are watching, how many people are on, but 
we are going to, I need to share this really, really quick. So give me just a second. just need to share the program really quick it won't take me but just a second and I'll be back with you all Done, guys. Well, <laughs> okay. Thank you so much for bearing with me, guys. I just need to let everybody know. And guys, if I, um, please forgive me if I, um, didn't tag you in this post right away because I'm just trying to get it up so that people know that we are up live and uh, I will go back and uh, fix where if any of you aren't All right, that's that, and we are back. I apologize for that. Um, hopefully, I'll be able to uh, get a few more people on now that I have shared the program. I forgot to, to do it when I first started, so I do apologize for that. But dispensationalism, okay, Dispensationalists understand the Bible to be organized into seven dispensations, and these seven dispensations are innocence, conscience, human government, promise, grace, and the millennial kingdom. Again, you know, these dispensationalists, or these dispensations, sorry, um, each one of these dispensations, they are not paths to salvation. Um, their manners in which God relates to man, okay? And each dispensation includes a recognizable pattern of how 
uh, God worked with people living in each dispensation. Uh, the, that pattern, um, you know, it, it's a response. It, it, it is a responsibility, a failure, a judgment, and grace to move on. Now, dispensationalism as a system results in a premillennial interpretation of Christ's second coming and usually a pre-tribulation interpretation of the rapture. Well, let me change that. It's almost always. I don't think I've ever heard of a dispensationalist who held to uh, the other uh, aspects of dispensationalism but yet rejected the pre-tribulation rapture. I don't think I've ever seen that. Um, so I wouldn't say, and you know, I'm not going to say for sure because there may be someone out there and there may be a group out there, but I have never heard of them. Now, you know, to summarize dispensationalism, it, it is, of course, a theological system that emphasizes the literal interpretation of Bible prophecy recognizes a distinction between Israel and the church and organizes the Bible into different dispensations or organizations. Um, uh, they claim to hold to a literal interpretation of Scripture. Um, And I would say that literal, you know, myself, I hold to a literal interpretation of Scripture. That's why I say I don't see how dispensationalism could be considered a literal interpretation of Scripture. But um, the literal interpretation gives each word the meaning it would commonly have in everyday usage and you know uh, of course there are allowances that are made for symbols and figure of speech and different um, types and shadows of course but it is you know, understood that even symbols and figurative sayings have literal meanings behind them so for example when the Bible speaks of a thousand years in Revelation 20. You know, dispensationalists interpret it as a literal period of 1,000 years. Now, that doesn't mean that dispensationalists are the only one who hold that the millennium is a literal thousand years. Um, there are many who believe that, but... Since dispensationalists interpret the millennium as a literal thousand-year period of time, it's um, part. It's one of the seven dispensations. It is the dispensation of the kingdom, and since there is no compelling reason to interpret it otherwise, they say, then that's the way it should be interpreted. Um, you know, I've done an entire program on the millennial reign, so we're definitely not going to even talk about that, or prophecy period in this program, except for when it concerns dispensationalism. Now, there are at least two reasons why literalism is the best way to view scripture. First off, um, philosophically, the purpose of language itself requires that we interpret words literally. Language was given by God for the purpose of being able to communicate. Words are vessels of meaning. The second reason is biblical. Every prophecy about Jesus Christ in the Old Testament was fulfilled literally. Jesus' birth, 
ministry, death, and resurrection all occurred exactly how the Old Testament predicted. You know, the prophecies were literal. You know, there's no non-literal fulfillment of Messianic prophe prophecies in the New Testament. You know, this strongly argues for the literal method and if a literal interpretation is not used in studying the scripture then there is no objective standard by which to understand the bible you know each person will be able to interpret the bible as he or she saw fit biblical interpretation would devolve into what this passage says and what that passage says to me you know it, it would all be about what the scripture is saying to me you know what i believe it says and sadly this is already the case in many churches and when i say churches i'm just talking about bodies of believers we're all the church but in many groups and many uh, systems of, it, of biblical interpretation and dispensationalism is one of those systems. You know, this is the case in dispensationalism. It's not a literal interpretation like they claim it is. Um, they literally have to add things to the gospel as well as the prophecies uh, eschatology in order for dispensationalism to be correct and we're going to cover all of that dispensational theology teaches that there are two distinct peoples of God this is my biggest problem with dispensationalism as uh, theology dispensationalism teaches that the two distinct peoples of God are Israel and the church dispensationalists believe that salvation has they actually allow me to say this um Dispensationalists believe that uh, that salvation, some dispensationalists and dispensationalists as a whole claim to believe in salvation by grace through faith alone that it's always been by grace through faith alone. Um, but this is why dispensationalism contradicts itself so much. And any system of belief that constantly contradicts itself is not of God because the Holy Spirit, God, is not the author of confusion. And, you know, Scripture, the only way to rightly divide the Word of God is for Scripture to interpret Scripture. And what I mean by that is a lot of times there will be a passage of Scripture that has different opinions on its interpretation. You know, I might believe that it should be interpreted this way, and you might believe that it should be interpreted that way. Well, the correct way of interpreting that scripture is not what I say or what you say. It's whatever way... Um, does not contradict any other part of Scripture. 
You see what I'm saying? Scripture cannot contradict itself. So therefore, the interpretation of a specific passage of Scripture or even the a, a, a theological system of belief such as dispensationalism or any other theology the only way that it or any other theology is correct is if it does not contradict any part of scripture I mean, you understand what I'm saying? I hope so. Dispensationalism not only contradicts itself, but it contradicts the Word of God. You know, dispensationalists claim two things that contradict one another right away. They believe and they teach that there are two distinct peoples of God, Israel and the church. Right, And they believe that God has two distinct plans for each, for Israel and the church. But then they claim to believe that salvation is and always has been by grace through faith alone. And in God in the Old Testament, and specifically in God the Son in the New Testament. Uh, you know, dispensationalists say that the church has not replaced Israel in God's program and that the Old Testament prov promises to Israel have not been transferred to the church. Dispensationalism teach that the promise God made to Israel in the Old Testament for land, many descendants, and blessings will ultimately be fulfilled in the thousand-year millennial reign spoken of in Revelation 20. Now, we are going to look at that claim right now. First of all, the, the, just the fact that dispensationalists um, really say uh, two things. Um, that there are, first off, that there are two distinct peoples of God, two... Uh, chosen people if you will um and that is the church the bride of christ and the people of israel the physical nation of israel and that the church hasn't replaced israel well guess what i agree with that part the church hasn't replaced israel israel was just transformed, period. You know, they um, talk constantly about how they interpret, they claim to interpret Scripture literally. Well, if they interpret the Old Testament literally, which is not the case, because a lot of dispensationalists, just like the Gnostics, want to do away with the Old Testament as far as they don't believe that it's relevant for the church. Now, they don't want to do away with it for the physical Jewish people. Uh, physical Israel, they believe the Old Testament is still very relevant for because they believe that all of these promises made to Israel in the Old Testament still have to be fulfilled. Well, you know what? I agree with that. The problem is that dispensationalists are just 100% wrong in the way that these promises will be fulfilled. Israel, first up, we're going to look at the most important that there are two i'm not going to say either one of them is most important i'm just going to say that there are two extremely important things that one must understand and if you understand these two things then 
God, if you if you will allow God to open your eyes and ears so that you can have eyes to see and ears to hear and understand just these two things, then you will be set free of this man-made belief system. And that is, the church didn't uh, replace Israel. Israel just changed. Israel was transformed from a physical people to a spiritual people. And just like the Word of God says that there is no more Jew or Greek, when it says there is no more Jew or Greek, it's talking about blood. You see, friends, God is no respecter of persons. And he sent his son, he literally became flesh, the only begotten Son of God, the physical representation of the Father, came down, allowed himself to be made a little lower than the angels, came down and bore all of our sins. And when I say all of our sins, I'm talking from... The beginning of creation to the end of it. Now, if Israel had not transformed from a physical people to a spiritual people, I mean, if, if Jesus would not have come, that wouldn't have happened. But Jesus came... To do something for us. All of mankind. He came to redeem us. And reunite us with the Father. You see, Jesus says, No man can come unto the Father except by him. And he systematically undid the sin of Adam and Eve in the garden on the cross. He gave us a way to overcome sin and death. Sin and death entered the world by and through one man and woman, but when it entered the world, everyone from that moment until the end of time is born with a sin nature and everyone sins. And because of that, we all are destined to die. But for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Not for God so loved one group of people. Well, when you don't understand that Jesus came to undo the sin of Adam and Eve and reunite the whole world with mankind by making Israel a spiritual people. Israel is still God's chosen. Israel is still the saints and people of God. They're still a nation of priests and kings. They're just not a physical nation. Israel is not about blood at all. Therefore, God does not have two plans. One for this physical nation on earth that's going to be fulfilled in a future thousand year reign. And... Another plan of salvation for the church. Because the church is Israel. And I'm not giving you my opinion. Dispensationalism is giving you their interpretation, their opinion. I am going to just simply give you scripture. Now, um... You know, 
we are going to start off here um, looking in the book of Galatians. So, if you have your Bibles, well, you know, Jacqueline, um, I uh, would agree with that, but I would say that the physical Jewish people period, physical Israel period from the time that Christ died, rose again, and ascended to the right hand of the Father from that moment on, uh, physical Israel had were no it, it was no longer physical and I'm fixing to uh, to show that to you but I do want to look at um, what you just said okay uh, I I see why you would say that about Revelation 11 too although um that's not exactly what Revelation 11 is talking about, but um, I did do uh, an entire program a couple of weeks ago on Revelation 11, and uh, remember how I was just saying that Revelation... Um, there is no such thing as spiritual Israel. That's all there is. Uh, you know what? This is what I'm going to do. Just I, instead of um, me trying to argue with anybody, I'm just going to let the scriptures do that for me. Um, turn in your Bibles, if you have your Bibles. To uh, the book of Galatians to begin with. We're just going to start off in the book of Galatians. And uh, we're going to look um, first of all oh, wrong thing. We're going to look at Galatians chapter 3. There is a, yep, Galatians chapter 3. I just want to make sure. I'm not speaking false doctrine. Uh, if you knew your Bible, you wouldn't be saying that. Is Paul speaking false doctrine? Um, let's go to the book of Galatians chapter number 3. Uh, and this is talking to anyone who doesn't understand that the Bible is clear. First of all, what was Israel chose for? Do you even know what Israel was chose for? Why, what were they chose for? Did God just say, I, I want a, a group of people that I can just give all these spiritual blessings to, all these physical blessings to? No. They were chose for one purpose, for the Messiah to come out of. And all of the promises that were made to the people of Israel, first of all, they were made first to Abraham. And all of the promises to Abraham and to Israel were not just, it's very clear in the Bible, they were not just open-ended promises. They were promises that were, they were not unconditional. They were conditional. They were based on the condition of being faithful and obeying God. First of all, God, right 
uh, after God take, took his people out of Egypt, right after he rescued them out of Egypt, when Moses went up to Mount Sinai, when they created the false calf and just flat out went into idolatry, God was ready to completely wipe them out. He told Moses, let me, I am going to kindle my wrath on these people and destroy all of them, and I will start over and make a, a great nation from you. I mean, he was ready to completely start over right then. That's how conditional those promises were. Before God chose Abraham, and we see in Galatians that he chose Abraham because of his faith. Abraham was not justified by his blood. He was justified by his faith. But before God chose Abraham, and even uh, after God chose Abraham, because it wasn't until uh, Jacob's name was changed to Israel that there was even a Israel. But before Abraham, before Isaac, before Jacob, before Israel, there were no, there were nothing but Gentiles. Everyone were Gentiles. Now, just open your Bibles, if you have them, to Galatians chapter 3. It says, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that ye should not obey the truth? before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you. This only what I learn of you, receive ye the Spirit by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith. Are ye so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? Have ye suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain. He therefore that minister that ministereth, ministereth to you the Spirit, and worketh miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. Paul is telling us right there that when God said to Abraham that in him would all nations be blessed. He was promising that through him the Messiah would come. That is exactly what the purpose and the purpose of Israel was and the way that all nations were blessed through them. You think that all nations were blessed by flesh and blood people? Of course not. <sighs> so then, they that, that which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. Faith in Jesus Christ makes you Israel. There is only the Israel of God. If you don't understand that Israel, joining Israel is through faith and it has got nothing to do with flesh and blood anymore, then you truly need to hit your knees with the Word of God. Don't get angry at me. Don't call me a false teacher. I'm simply doing what is supposed to be done, which is taking the Scriptures literally for what it says. Now, you know, Right back to Galatians chapter 3 again, taking up where we left off in verse 10, it says, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. 
For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them, but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. It is evident, for the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. That the blessing of Abraham, listen, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men, though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth thereto. Now Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. You see, the seed of Abraham was Jesus Christ. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more a promise. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which, which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. Listen to this. I don't even know if you're still there because you quit commenting and it's fine because, you know, I, all I can do is plant seeds and give truth and you know those of you who watch me regularly know that you know I do not come on here giving my opinions and anytime I do come on here giving my opinions I state them as opinions but I never come on here and say this is the truth when it's just my opinion now this is one of the most important... Now, I never come on and just cherry-pick scriptures, which is why I started at verse 1. But this is one of the most important verses in Galatians chapter 3. Paul says, For ye are all the children of God... What? All ye all are the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. 
There is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then ye are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So yes, not only is there a spiritual Israel, but that's all there is. Faith is the way that you come into the covenant and the promise that was given unto Abraham. Faith is what decides if you are Abraham's seed, and, a, and Abraham's seed is what? If you are heirs according to the promise, you are what? Israel. The Israel of God. That is the only Israel there is. There is only believers and followers of Jesus Christ and non-believers. Now, this is the point that I was making about dispensationalists saying that God has two chosen people, but also claiming to have to take the scriptures literally, to have a literal interpretation of scripture. You can't, you cannot interpret Galatians chapter 3 or anything else in the Bible for that matter. You can't interpret the gospels literally, Paul's epistles literally. Uh, you can't interpret the books of Jude, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Peter, you can't interpret the, pretty much the entire New Testament or the Old Testament for that matter, literally, but yet believe that there are two chosen people of God and that God has a specific plan for each of them. The New Testament, the uh, I think the correct way, there, there are some that do not like the terms Old and New Testament. And I guess in a sense of Scripture, you know, as far as Scripture goes, I understand that. It's just the, the Word of God. And I agree with that. However, a better way to look at it is the Old Testament and new covenant and scripture is very clear even in the old testament it is very clear that there's gonna be a new covenant a new covenant but with the same people it says with the house of israel and judah so therefore if there was going to be a new covenant but with the same people, the only way that that is possible, according to what the New Testament tells us, is if the definition of what makes somebody a part of the house of Israel and Judah changes, and it did. No, the church didn't, uh, I guess, the church didn't replace Israel. And anybody who looks at it that way is simply trying to defend their doctrine by calling anyone who doesn't agree with them a racist and an anti-Semite. The church didn't replace Israel. Israel was transformed. The covenant was changed. The requirements were changed. Now, we also see Paul tells us that, you know, he talks about the olive tree, the cultivated olive tree, and how um, he 
it talks about the natural branches and, and us who are not of physical Israel, how we were grafted in to, to, go to the cultivated olive tree. The same thing that he was saying in Galatians about there being no more Greek or Jew. Um, now, if there was going to be a separate way for the physical um, Israel to come to salvation other than um, Jesus Christ. I am. What's up, AJ? Yo, yo, yo. If there was another way for physical Israel to come to salvation other than faith in Jesus Christ, then I'm pretty sure that Jesus himself would have said it. It would have been taught in the Gospels. Not only that, but when Paul, the greatest missionary who ever lived, was teaching and writing when he was literally converting the Gentiles across all of Asia Minor and turning the world upside down for Jesus Christ in his letters to the Romans, the Ephesians, the Galatians, the Philippians, I am pretty sure the, uh, let's see, Mr. GC15 says, uh, what is my take on the apocryphal Gospels? Uh, if you're talking Gospels of Thomas, uh, the infancy Gospel of Thomas, um, that type of thing, uh, I, um, my take on them is uh, they're Gnostic and false. Um, you know, I, uh, I think that the Word of God is complete. Um, I think God's Word is inerrant. I think Scripture is... All of Scripture is been uh, oh okay well those are not gospels I understand um, you talk, you're talking the Apocrypha oh look I think the Apocrypha should have stayed right where it was at um, the Apocrypha should have never been taken out of the Bible. Um, does that mean that it is necessarily inspired? I, you know, I, I know that um, whether or not it is on the same level as what's in the say the King James Bible now um, I don't know but I would I would tend to believe that it's at least on the same level as the other books of history um, and there are look there are prophecies in um, like the the book of Second Baruch that are I think it's second Baruch. It's 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 one. It's either first or second Baruch that um, are messianic prophecies, and it is that's not the only uh, book that's like that. I mean, you, the wisdom of Solomon is in the apocrypha, um, and. 
you know, in the books of Maccabees, you can literally see things that let you know why Israel is in the state it's in when Jesus is, when he comes on the scene, when he's born and he's, you know, in his ministry. The Maccabean revolts, um, you know, there, there is some truly, truly amazing bravery uh, battles. There is great faith seen in the books of Maccabees. Um, you know, I uh, truly believe, you know, in the Bible that I read most of the time, it uh, has the Apocrypha in it. Um, a lot of time, it, it's also, you know, I, I, I read the King James Bible, but I also, the, the Bible that I have started reading more than any other is the Orthodox Study Bible. And the Orthodox Study Bible is, um, it's got the, the Apocrypha in it, and, um, it also, uh, it's not, it's not written based on the same text as the King James. As a matter of fact, it's the only Bible that I know of. I think it's the only uh, English translation that there is that was written, that was translated from the Septuagint for the Old Testament instead of um, the uh, instead of the Masoretic, the Hebrew Masoretic. And uh, there was a time when I would never have used a Bible that was based on anything other than the Hebrew Masoretic. There was a time that I was King James only. But studying the Masorites themselves and um, the modern Hebrew language as created by the Masorites um, and studying the Septuagint and the fact that the Septuagint is a copy of the original Hebrew Old Testament to where the Masoretic, you know, maybe it's a copy of the original Hebrew, but if it is, then there's still uh, quite a bit that the Masorites, there, there's agenda, a, a lot, there was definitely hidden um, agendas that the Masorites themselves had, reason for their vowel points, and so on. Um, you know, the the Septuagint translation of the Old Testament is written in Greek. And the ancient Hebrew, the Paleo Hebrew, is what the Old Testament for the most part, most of the Old Testament books were written in Paleo-Hebrew. And 
the Greek language itself was created from the ancient Paleo Hebrew. If you hold the the Kone, Kone however you say it, K O I N E Greek and Paleo Hebrew side by side, they're almost identical. And the only difference is Hebrew is read from uh, right to left and Greek is from left to right. But the letters themselves are the same. And so for that reason, and also because you, the, the Septuagint Old Testament, reading it, you're not going to come up with anything different than reading, you know, the, the, any other translation of the Old Testament. It's, all, it's not like it, it reads something else. It tells you something else. There's just, you know, little differences. But I, I'm getting off subject talking about translations. Um, we, uh, need to understand that the biggest problem with dispensationalism is the fact that it when it when you change the gospel message the way of salvation for anybody then you're adding to scripture. Now, my thing is this, okay? Um, if things like the timing of the rapture were the only problem with dispensationalism then I'd say okay because you know that's not you know it's not a big deal I'd say fine it's a big deal in the sense that if people are expecting to be raptured before things get bad on the earth then they're not going to prepare for it they aren't going to be worried about what's taking place and they're not going to um be able to recognize it when it comes and that's not good for them but more than that when people believe that and first of all the dispensational viewpoint of the end times especially where the Jewish people are concerned and you know how it differs for them than it does for the followers of Christ the church it all goes back to them believing that God has two plans one for the physical nation of Israel and one for the church well if the Bible makes it clear that there is no more Jew or Greek, that Gentiles, or oh, forget Gentiles and Jews. The Bible says there is no more Jew or Gentile. The Bible says that everyone who has faith in Jesus Christ becomes adopted into the cultivated olive tree of the Israel of God. That means that regardless to what you were born as, I mean, it don't matter if you were born as a person in China, Japan, Africa, Israel, Iran, or the United States of America. It doesn't matter what color you are. The only way that 
you can become a part of Israel is by accepting Jesus Christ. It doesn't only talk about grafting us in. It also talks about grafting in the natural branches. Grafting them back in. Now why would Paul talk about grafting them back in if they were already saved? If just being Jews was all that they needed, then, you know, why would they need to be grafted back in? Now, I want to say that the fact, you know, dispensationalists, they believe that in that just as God in this age uh, focuses his attention on the church, that Again, in the future, in the tribulation, he's going to, again, focus his attention on Israel. And they use Romans, uh, starting in chapter 9, to um, defend this belief. And whenever I did the program on the um, Israel of God, when I did the program on who are God's chosen people, we went to Romans chapter 9, and we started from the beginning because I had somebody come in the comments and say that uh, only physical Jews were God's chosen people, and he quoted Romans chapter 9, uh, I don't remember what verse, but they, dispensationalists, cite Romans chapters 9 through 11 as their proof of God focusing his attention once again on physical Israel in the future. Uh, and I want to go to Romans chapter 9 really quick and read it. It says, Starting in verse 1, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. So Paul's talking about Israel here, the Jewish people, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory, and the covenants, and the giving of the law, and the service of God, and the promises. Whose are the fathers, and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came? Who is, over all, God blessed forever? Amen. Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect. For they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. Now, right off the bat here, I think it's quite clear who Paul's talking about. And when we get to uh, verse number 6, he says, They are not all Israel, which are of Israel. That would be confusing if Israel was a flesh and blood kingdom now. If the people of Israel, if the Israel of God was about flesh and blood, that passage would make no sense. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham... Are they all children? But in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh. These are not the children of God, 
but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. For this is the word of promise. At this time will I come, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when, Be when Rebekah also has conceived by one, even by our father Isaac. For the children, being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God, according to election, might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. It was said unto her, The elder shall serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Now that was the verse that the man uh, quoted in the comment back in um, December of 2019 when I did the program on um, the Israel of God and God's chosen. And what I did was went back and read this entire chapter. It said, what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then, it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, Even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might shew my power in thee and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will part, and whom he will he hardeneth. Thou wilt say then unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Nay, but O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? What if God, willing to shew his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction? and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory, even us whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. As he saith also in O.C., I will call, listen, I will call them my people, which were not my people, and her beloved, which was not beloved. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, there shall they be called the children of the living God. Isaiah also crieth concerning Israel, Through the number of the children of Israel, be as the, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant shall be saved. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness. But because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. And Isaiah said before, except the Lord of Sabaoth left us a seed, we have been as Sodom and made like unto Gomorrah. What shall we say then that the Gentiles which followed not after righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith? But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, they have not attained the law of righteousness. Wherefore? Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law, for they stumbled at that stumbling stone. As it is written, 
Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling block and a rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Now, Paul says in chapter 10, in chapter 9, he's very clear that his heart is breaking for his kinsmen, his brothers and sisters of the flesh, because they have rejected, for the most part, Jesus Christ. They rejected and crucified him. And he truly wants the physical nation of Israel to repent and come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Now, in chapter 10, it starts off, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them a record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise, Say not in thine heart who shall ascend into heaven, that is, to bring Christ down from above, or who shall descend into the deep, that is, to bring Christ again from the dead. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith, which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah said, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes. Verily, their sound went into all the earth, and their words unto the ends of the world. But I say, did not Israel know? First Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people, and by a foolish nation I will anger you. But Isaiah is very bold and saith, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. But to Israel, he saith, all day long I have stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. Chapter 11 picks right up where chapter 10 left off. I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. Hath God not cast away his people which he foreknew? What ye not what the scripture saith of Elias? How he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets, and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself seven thousand men, 
who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. A remnant, again, just as he said before, just as Isaiah said, a remnant only, just as God told Elijah, a remnant, 7,000 hath he reserved to himself who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Even so then, at this present time also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. According as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear unto this day. And David saith, Let their table be made a snare, and a trap, and a stumbling block, and a recompense unto them. Let their eyes be darkened, that they may not see, and bow down their back alway. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their fall salvation is come unto the Gentiles, for to provoke them to jealousy. Now if the fall of them be the riches of the world, and the dis diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am, the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. If by any means I may provoke the emulation, them which are my flesh, and might save some of them. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? For if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou being a wild olive tree were grafted in among them, partakest of the root and the fatness of the olive tree. Boast not against the branches. But if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief they were broken off, and thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not those natural branches, take heed, lest he also spare thee not. Behold, therefore the goodness and severity of God on them which fell, severity. But toward thee, goodness, if thou continue in his goodness. Otherwise, thou also shalt be cut off. And they also, if they abide not, still in unbelief, shall be grafted back in. For God is able to graft them in again. For if thou were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these which be the natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should, other, should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved as it is written. There shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes. But as touching the election, they are beloved for the father's sakes. For the gifts and calling of gods are without repentance. For as ye in times past have not believed in God, yet now have obtained mercy through their unbelief, even so have these also now not believed, that through your mercy they may obtain mercy. For God hath concluded them all in unbelief, that he might have mercy upon all. O oh, the depth! of the riches, both the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments, 
and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counselor, or who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again? For of him, and through him, and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Okay. Now, like I said, the reason that dispensationalism teaches that in the age of grace, which is from the time of Christ, hey brother, I'm glad you're still here, from the time of Christ through the time of the rapture, they teach that that is the age of grace that will end when the time of the kingdom begins and that God in the age of grace, in the dispensation of grace, has taken his eyes off of the physical nation of Israel and put his eyes or you know his attention and his grace onto the church being all, any gentiles who want to come in and accept Jesus Christ but that at the end of the age of grace what they're getting from Romans 9 through 11 is that when the fullness of the Gentiles comes into the olive tree, God will turn his attention to Israel and all Israel will be saved. But if you read uh, Romans chapter 9 through 11 the way we just did, it says over and over, that the same thing Galatians said, that there is no more Jew or Greek, and that we who have faith in Jesus Christ are cultivated into the olive tree that is the Israel of God. Now, when it talks about, it says that just like in the Old Testament, when only a remnant were saved, that again, a remnant in the time of Christ and in this day and age and the end times, a remnant of Israel will be saved. And when I say Israel, I'm talking about the physical Israel um, God is no respecter of persons. <sighs> First of all, before there was ever Jews and Gentiles, in the very first prophecy that was made in Genesis chapter 3. God is talking to both Eve and the serpent. And he tells Eve, he gives a promise talking about her seed and the seed of the serpent. That's the very first prophecy ever made. So, we know that the seed of the woman was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. The exact same thing is true with the seed of Abraham. Jesus was the seed. He was the fulfillment of the promise to Abraham. And 
when Jesus came, it is so clear to anyone who truly reads the Bible without these glasses that we put on of the particular doctrines we were raised in and the teachings and interpretations of Scripture that we were taught. If we will throw away all these man-made interpretations and do what dispensational claims to do, which is take the scripture literally and let scripture interpret the scripture, then, you know, we really, we would all be on the same page if we would all do the same thing. But we human beings think we know best. I mean, that's the reason why even in the body of Christ there's dissension and arguing with people calling the other one's names. And, you know, I, I, oh, man, I tell you what, this is something that truly burdens me deep down in my spirit. When I see brothers and sisters on Facebook or wherever, comments on YouTube videos, just lashing out at each other, it, that is not the way someone with the spirit of the living God is supposed to treat anyone else. I mean, our enemies... are supposed to be treated with love. And we don't even treat our friends that way for the most part. Let us get upset and it's like we revert right back to our fallen nature. Guys, I... Uh, hope that I've been able to, for the most part, get you to understand at least the dispensational doctrine of separate plans for separate people is false. I know I wasn't able to completely... Um, cover all of dispensationalism, although I, I, in the beginning of the program, I did pretty much um, explain, you know, how there are seven different dispensations, and, um, but there is a lot more to dispensational theology than we covered here today, but I am uh, pretty much out of time. We've been going for a lot longer than I intended to go, um, you know, I've got other programs on the same subject. Uh, I did a three-part series on just the Israel of God uh, in, uh, back in 2019, end of 2019. And uh, I've done programs against specific dispensational doctrines. And, uh, you know, you can find... Find all of those in the, the archives on Facebook and on YouTube. And, um, you know, I truly thank each and every one of you for uh, taking the time to uh, come and fellowship with me and uh, study the Word of God and rightly divide the Word of Truth. Um, we are going to uh, close now with a word of prayer, and um, that is going to pretty much do it for this edition of the Remnant Report, and uh, again, you know, I 
thank all of you guys for tuning in and I hope that you will all come back next time and that we will be able to continue to study the word of God and spread the gospel to the lost as well as edify the body. Dear Heavenly Father, I come before you now and I just thank you so much for blessing me with this platform. I thank you for blessing all of the people who are alive on this earth, no matter where we come from, what our background is, what our uh, fleshly uh, origins are, what our race is, what our sex is. Father, if we accept Jesus Christ, then we become part of the elect, your people. Father, I thank you so much for sending Jesus Christ to give us the opportunity to come back into reconciliation with you, Father. Father, I pray that if there is anyone within the sound of my voice who does not know Jesus Christ as their Messiah and Lord, and they have not surrendered their lives to Christ and confessed with their mouth and believed in their heart, that, Father, that today would be the day of salvation for them, Lord. Father, I thank you for all your many blessings. And I know that your will is perfect and your timing is perfect. And at the same time that I pray for more time for the lost who don't know you to be able to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ at the same time I say, Maranatha, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Father God, I love you and I ask all these things in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, my Lord. Amen. Again, guys, for... The Next Chapter Radio Network and Kingdom Productions. I am the Remnant Warrior saying until next time, God bless and grace and peace.